right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jeff Gordon. Uh, I wanted to welcome everybody to uh, the panel on the future of reinforcement learning at the Microsoft Research Summit. Um, so we have uh, a bunch of really amazing guests with us today. Uh, so what I'd like to do is to start off with everybody giving um, a brief self-introduction uh, and then maybe uh, at the same time saying something about um, a trend that they think is important for the future of uh, RL research. Maybe take, uh, you know, two or three minutes a piece. So um, maybe Emma, if you'd like to start off, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm Emma Brenskill. I'm an associate professor of computer science at Stanford. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My goal is to create artificial intelligence systems that learn from few samples to robustly make good decisions. Um, I'm particularly interested in new reinforcement learning algorithms um, and creating theoretical analysis to understand what's possible. Um, and I'm inspired by the technical challenges that come up in applications to situations where AI systems are interacting with people, like in healthcare, education, or in criminal justice. Um, I think it's really exciting to get to be talking about the future of RL today, and I guess I'll just say one thing that I think is really exciting right now, which is that reinforcement learning now is starting to become a little bit like regression used to be, and now machine learning is, um, in that in all aspects of computer science, people are using reinforcement learning. When I talk to my systems colleagues, when I talk to my HCI colleagues, when I go on Twitter, I, I see new application areas to blockchain, to, to numerous different application areas. And so I think that reinforcement learning is starting to become a basic technology used uh, for a wide variety of computer science research. And that's an incredible advance compared to where things were 10 or 20 years ago. On the other hand, I think that while there's some increasing excitements in the applications to industry, there's a huge lag between how much computer science research has embraced reinforcement learning and the enormous number of places where I believe that evidence-based data-driven decision-making could be beneficial. So I'm excited to think about how we can tackle that gap um, to enable these sorts of technologies and methodologies to be beneficial to the widest you know, proportion of people possible. All right, thank you, Emma, and welcome. Um, Chavo, would you like to go next? Sure, uh, thank you. I'm Chavo Sepeshwari. I'm a professor at the University of Alberta and a research scientist at DeepMind, where I'm leading the foundation's team. And uh, I've been working on reinforcement learning since the beginning of my career, and uh, that's my main interest. I think, uh, as Emma said, we have a tremendous opportunity in front of us and people are discovering reinforcement learning these days, how useful it could be for different applications. And uh, it's really great to see that. Uh, much work lies ahead uh, to make the algorithms more robust, more scalable, uh, and uh, easier to diagnose in various applications. I myself, um, mostly work on, on three, but I'm mostly inspired by applications. Uh, so here, uh, on the theoretical aspects, I think we made uh, quite a bit progress, but still there is much uh, that lies ahead. And I think that we, we start to have some good understanding of generalization and reinforcement learning of how that works, but uh, there are big gaps uh, in terms of uh, more challenging applications. Uh, so for example, one, one example would be when you have partial observability of some kind and people are exploring all kind of directions here, but uh, I feel that there is much to be discovered still in that direction. Very cool, thank you. Um, Sean, would you like to go next? Hi Jeff, thanks. So I'm Sean Kakade. I'm a professor at the University of Washington and a researcher at Microsoft. Uh, I work on, broadly speaking, uh, mathematical and algorithmic foundations in uh, AI and machine learning with uh, a recent focus in reinforcement learning and uh, natural language processing. Uh, maybe I'll mention a trend uh, which I find interesting, which isn't directly RL, but it has some relations to the area. And these are these uh, pretty impressive results in uh, program synthesis and, say, uh, symbolic and mathematical reasoning where uh, we can do pretty well, say, doing integration or actually competing programs. And what's interesting here is 
uh, these are results where we would think there's some type of planning algorithm under the hood, uh, but the methods that have been used so far, we don't directly see how, how they're doing that. And this is an area that uh, could potentially benefit tremendously from uh, interactive learning. Awesome, thank you. Um, so, uh, Joel, how about uh, you go next? Thanks, Jeff. Um, great to be joining the panel today. I'm Joelle Pinot. I'm a faculty member at the School of Computer Science at McGill University. I'm also managing director of Facebook AI Research Labs. Um, it's um, it's been a long journey of you know doing RL research for me, and and really from the beginning, I've been deeply motivated by applications of RL to the real world, and so really trying to figure out what we need to solve in terms of uh, foundation problems in order to enable these practical applications, uh, mostly in healthcare and in robotics in my case, um, but fortunately many other people have, have contributed by bringing in other applications. In terms of um, more recent research, I've been really driven by the issue of reproducibility and ensuring that the results that we are producing and sharing with the community, in fact, are meeting our high standards of scientific integrity. And so really trying to think of how do we influence the community to take that on in a more um, communal way. Um, the, the other trend that's a bit more technical that I would love to bring to the table today is the following. Um, the, the field of RL has been, I will say, maybe stuck in this, this um, trade-off between exploration and exploitation for many, many decades now. Um, and I think that's a bit too unidimensional. And I think as we think of bringing applications um, to, to people, to society, we need to be much more thoughtful about blowing up that space of criteria and to take into account issues such as fairness, such as um, safety, security, um, transparency, and really fold that back into our approaches for RL. So that's what you know. I've been I've been trying to work on. I, I welcome the opportunity to to share that with more people on today's panel. Very cool. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Craig, um, you're the last on our panel. All right. So, um, and it, I hope the uh, the audio quality is is uh, and recording quality is good enough. Apologies if it's not. Um, so uh, my name is Craig Bootlier. I'm a principal scientist at uh, at Google Research. Um, although I spent about 25 years in academia prior to joining Google, uh, what really motivated me to get involved in AI is to put decision support tools and advanced state-of-the-art decision-making methods in the hands of real users. So coming to Google has given me an opportunity to, to start to explore that a lot more richly, and in particular, I've really been focused on recommender systems, and in particular, what I like to call user-centric recommender systems. These are systems that in in a nutshell are really designed to act in a user's best interest you know, based on their particular needs, constraints, and preferences, engage with them in a very natural, unobtrusive, and transparent for uh, using uh, uh, those types of interactions. Um, and how does this connect to RL? Well, ultimately, if we want to act in a user's best interest, we have to understand their, their latent context, we have to understand their preferences, all of those factors that influence what is, what is in their best interest, what is good or bad for them. Uh, and naturally, RL is going to play a, a, a pretty critical role there in, in driving those interactions. But um, just in terms of where I see some pretty significant gaps in the use of RL, for in, in interacting with real users, especially in recommender systems, is I, you know I don't think we have a we don't have the types of technologies yet that can really understand sophisticated latent state, which I've mentioned, partial observability, uh, to understand the kind of latent state and be able to make decisions for users, um, uh, recognizing how highly variable their, their preferences and interests can be. We don't have the kind of technologies that can deal with kind of the complex action and response spaces. Uh, when we're interacting with real users, we have to worry about various behavioral phenomena, the fact that you know what users do and what they say 
may not actually reflect their true underlying best interests. Um, uh, so I think a lot of behavioral economics and psychology needs to be brought to bear if RL is, gonna, is going to work there. And finally, there's this whole issue of, I'll call it complex multi-agent interactions. Our, our tools, our agents that, that we build to put in front of users, we often think about, can I act in this user's best interest? But in fact, we're, uh, the, our systems connect billions and billions of users and the action we take for one user is going to have an impact on what we're able to do for other users. Whether we're talking about fairness, uh, uh, um, things like uh, effective use of resources, even just user attention uh, relating to a couple of the themes that Joelle mentioned. So I think multi-agent, especially social choice based and game theoretic and mechanism design based RL is probably an important next frontier that we need to tackle. Cool. Um, thank you, Craig, and thank you, everybody. Um, so, uh, man, that's a huge list of uh, things I don't know how to answer. Um, so uh, I think I think we've got way more than 45 minutes worth of discussion to have here. Um, but let's let's pick something um, to get started with. So I noticed a few uh, a few common themes. Um, right. Several people mentioned. Um, uh, paying more attention to things like safety or security or fairness. Um, several people mentioned um, uh, getting theory and applications to be a little bit closer together. Um, several people mentioned um, uh, the, the idea of combinatorial choices, uh, where both our world and our action spaces might be combinatorial and we need to do effectively search as well as sort of the traditional RL. Um, and all of these, like, we could have hours of conversation on all of them. Um, but maybe let's pick one. Um, uh, what should we what should we do to handle combinatorial thinking, right? Like it, it's often been said that reinforcement learning is a tool for finding bugs in your world model. Um, and I think that that's sort of most true in the case where there's like a lot of, you know, complicated combinatorial relationships among objects in our model. So, um, yeah, what are we going to do? Does anybody want to go first? Joelle. I can jump in first. I will, I will save myself and, you know, I, I will not necessarily tell you what we can do. I will tell you what I, I find particularly hard about that, that part of the problem. Then maybe, you know, someone else has, has better ideas of how to solve. But one of the things I think we're still really struggling with is it relates to this, this notion of generalization. And, and I think in the perceptual space, um, we've done really well in terms of having much stronger models of generalization. But when it comes to the action space um, and to the space of goals and intents, all of that, I think we're, we're much more early on in our, in our investigation of how we might be able to generalize. And so that combinatorial problem really hits us hard because we, we don't really know how to, how to overcome this generalization portion. Yeah. Maybe one hint of where we might look, you know, there's a lot of work on compositionality in, in the supervised learning and in other fields. And I do think that a lot of that work on compositionality down the line will help us tackle this, yeah. this problem. Yeah, um, I feel but, like... But um, I think there's still a long road to go. Yes, yeah. I, I feel like um, RL almost gives us too much rope, right? Like the fact that we are... Um, changing our policy based on what we think gives us the opportunity to sort of mess ourselves up with anything we fail to learn correctly. Um, yeah. So, Craig, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I completely agree with the, the, the points that Joel made. Um, at one level, I think a lot of, especially thinking about the combinatorics of state spaces and action spaces, we're, you know, we, we, we're better, I think, with state spaces than we are with with complicated action spaces. Um, but uh, you know, in some sense, you know, getting the right the right language to describe our actions. Um, you know, having you know having compositional descriptions of actions, which is something that people have been doing in the knowledge representation and the planning communities for. Uh, for decades. Um, they're probably not as sophisticated as the type of representations we need uh, in general. But um, 
I don't know that it's a, a specifically an RL problem, right? I don't think we, yeah, I, I think in RL, we often say, hey, here's a new problem. Let's go ahead and solve it when there are lots of other communities that have already um, uh, taken some steps there. So, for example, we've done work where we deal with, say, slates of recommendations, which is inherently combinatorial in the RL setting. And, you know, dealing with slate optimization under sophisticated choice models is something that hey, people in management science and OR have been studying for, for decades. So you can actually start to lift those tools and, and uh, apply them directly in, in, in RL. You're just going to replace your, the objective function with, for the individual items with uh, long-term values as opposed to some sort of immediate value, right? So the, the optimization and the learning, they, 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 they kind of feed into, um, feed into one another. Same thing, and Joel, I know you've got a lot of experience here with dialogue, for example. Again, the compositionality of dialogue. If we really want to get that right to put together a good sequence of utterances, um, you know, we just need good representations of the components of the actions that I think we, we need to piece together. Yeah, yeah so, so I think, um... I don't know. So, so I agree. It's it's one hundred percent not an RL only issue, but in some sense, maybe RL pushes harder on compositionality than than other uh, domains because, sort of, you know, we have the we have the opportunity to sort of, um, I don't know, build towers of sand, right? Like we can think about what's going to happen and get that a little bit wrong, and think about what's going to happen after that based on and you know get that a little bit more wrong, right? And we just um, after not too many steps of combinatorial reasoning, we are completely hallucinating. And I feel that that's like a, a that's sort of, it's got exploration flavor to it. It's got combinatorics flavor to it. And it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's strongest in RL. Um, I don't know if that's, um, uh, you know, if other people have that same uh, intuition or not. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, so uh, just following up, on uh, both Joel's and Craig's comments that we do tend to have a pretty good understanding. Like in some ways, uh, I think it's fair to say that we understand uh, dealing with states more than actions, but there's something uh, somewhat similar in both of these settings. And you know, if we think about supervised learning, uh, we don't really ask these questions about a combinatorial representation of our input. Uh, sometimes they do, but by and large, our methods seem to work uh, out of the box and we just set things up as a prediction problem. And in RL, we can try to set things up in a prediction problem too, but we do worry about this. And this is where some of, I think, uh, a lot of the, um, the work with regards to generalization that a number of us here have worked on, I think are shedding light on things, because in RL, I think there's a growing body of work really showing that things like, you know, this quote unquote reward is enough is really not enough. We actually have to discover something underlying about the world in order to generalize. And uh, th that like all our theory for when we can actually do well, something about our underlying representations tend to be tied to the world. And I think one of the directions here that uh, Craig mentioned upon and kind of everyone was how we learn a representation. And for me, I think getting at this combinatorial nature of both the rewards and actions is what's the way in which representation learning changes when we're in an interactive setting? And, and somehow what we want is to build representations that can support interactive learning, these combinatorial structure, but we can't just do this passively. And, and that's something that uh, I, I do feel is a pretty exciting uh, direction here. Cool, thank you. Um, Chaba next, and then we'll go back to Craig. Sure. Uh... Yeah, I wanted to say something similar. Maybe the only thing I would add is that I think from the theory, we, we are starting to see some signs that large action spaces are actually different than large state spaces. Uh, so that's kind of interesting and, and uh, we will see how much that holds on. The other thing that I want to add is that there is a fundamental intractability to a lot of these problems. So, so whenever we are hoping to see some solutions, that's going to need some, you know, like extra human support. Uh, so even though like that somehow sneakily happens all the time with the perceptual task as well, because our networks are not designed in completely arbitrary way and they are helped in many ways. And so I think that the same thing is going to happen and we'll have 
we'll need to have develop more understanding of the particle task that we want to solve. And there we can build in the machinery of value functions, policy classes, whatnot, and uh, we can make some progress with this task. Uh, but it, it's not like that. Uh, it's just magically uh, going to solve itself. Uh, so there's some, some real work uh, ahead in terms of like discovering and figuring out which of these tasks we can do under what conditions. I, can, I just want to check, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so, uh, so I apologize, my, my browser went, uh, went down. I just caught the tail end of what Sean had, had to say. Um, maybe just, uh, and if this got addressed while I was out, I apologize. Uh, one, one counterpoint to, to an issue you raised, Jeff, is that in RL, you know, you talked about you know, the towers of sand that we can compound these errors. But unlike in the supervised case, I think that we also have the advantage that we can, uh, we can connect how, how good our representations are to how well they support decisions. So, you know, we don't have to worry necessarily about, hey, do I have a perfectly accurate classifier, maybe able to perfectly generalize, right? As long as I can do well enough to make the right call or make the right decision, I think that 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 that's really helpful um and just catching the tail end of what sean said i, I I'd, I'd like to echo that i think that's that's really critical when we talk about um uh, interactive systems i don't think we have a very good idea of what good representations actually look like we think about representations of of objects in the real world and, and those types of classifiers but ultimately uh, at, at least for the types of problems that I'm most interested in, we're going to have to do a much better job of understanding kind of what's in a user's head, what do they want to accomplish, and that's always going to be very latent, very noisy, very highly unobserved, partially observable, I, I should say. Um, and I don't know yet that we've thought very hard about the representations that can support interactive systems under the un, uh, under the, what I'll call extreme uncertainty like that, right? Our systems are going to have to quantify their uncertainty, I think, to know what to ask and what to do to, to account for risk. But our systems are going to have to know what they don't know and act, uh, act accordingly, which is something we haven't, I think, in the RL community, we haven't done much on. Maybe I'll just Absolutely. jump in on top. Thank you, Emma. Yes, please jump in. To say, um, uh, that uh, I agree with all the comments that were just made. I think um, building on maybe something that Trouble was saying, I think one thing that's really exciting from a theoretical perspective is the recent interest from our lab and other lab, including people here, on instance-dependent results, where we can move from sort of worst-case results, which, as Trouble was mentioning, often can be quite dis <laughs> discouraging in certain ways, um, to uh, looking at what is the structure that is places where we both expect things to do much better, um, as well as ones where the structure is actually realistic for the types of problems that we're encountering. So I think that's an exciting place to think about where is there going to be structure that we can leverage. Um, but perhaps on a more practical level, um, I, I agree that one of the big challenges is when we get the representations wrong or we have model misspecification, we get this compounding of errors. On the other hand, one of the huge benefits of being in the interactive setting is that we can replan and we can um, update after each step. And so I think that has been shown to be incredibly powerful in controls for a long time, um, but it's also something that we can leverage greatly here in order to get good performance. That is definitely true. Um, so uh, Joelle, you indicated you had something to say? I feel like Chaba left us a bit on like a hanging question of, you know, the, this question of, of, you know, is there something that's genuinely harder about the action space than, than there is about the, the state space? And, and maybe you know something, I'm, I'm sure you know many things I don't know on this. Um, I think when the, one of the questions that I'm stuck with on, the, on this topic is, you know, the, the combinatorial problem shows up on the state space also, um, but somehow the natural world, the distribution of data, data that we see has a way of reducing that um, significantly. 
and and so we're able to take you know advantage of that and leverage this and so i feel we've we've really not you know done the same on the action space on the policy space in particular except maybe in some problems in robotics where uh, the working with the physical hardware really constrains that naturally so those constraints are coming from that physical space um, but in a lot of the other problems that we that we take on in practice we don't we don't take into account those natural constraints and therefore we're, we're really we're really not able to handle that that combinatorial complexity and so I, I think there's some in, something interesting there to, to dig into, yeah. perhaps. So let me let me quickly jump in to, to say there are you know, two things specifically that wind up being different in RL versus other kinds of learning. Um, one is the need to think about off-policy behavior, right? So we need to reason about what might happen if we did do something. Um, and then the other is that realizability seems to play a different role in theoretical results. And I'm not sure, I'm probably the wrong person to talk about that. But, um, uh, you know, I know, for example, I've read some uh, recent papers from uh, people here showing um, interesting dichotomies between the realizable and the nearly realizable case. So I wanted to add those. Um, so I think um, Craig and Chaba were maybe both interested in saying something. Maybe Craig first and then Chaba. Whoops, have we lost Craig again? I'm also, well, okay. I think yeah, maybe I just jump in in, in the meanwhile while Craig hopefully comes back. I'm sure uh, Shem could add also a lot because uh, somehow it was their paper which kind of noticed this phenomenon first uh, that uh, that says that if you want your error suboptimality, uh, policy suboptimality level to be comparable to the misspecification level, then you will uh, meet some intractability information theoretical intractability problems. And uh, there, there is no way around that. Uh, so you have to accept, uh, well, it depends on the situation, but you have to ac accept some level of inflation of, of the error, of the misspecification level, uh, which is uh, a bit of unknown and unseen in supervised learning. Although I would say that uh, in the linear regression literature, I think that people kind of knew this, uh, but they were not really too much interested in. Uh, so the difference is between controlling errors uh, with respect to the worst case or controlling errors on the average. If you want to control errors in a worst case, which seems to be necessary for control, and that's kind of the, the new revelation that you, you have to do that for control, you, there is no way around that. I mean, like it, it seems that maybe it's just a bad choice that we need to control the L infinity error, the, the, the uniform, the worst case error, but no, actually in some problems, that's the only way uh, you can achieve a good performance. So then, uh, in back in supervised learning, if you wanted to control worst case errors, then like you have the same inflation. So it's basically an extrapolation cost that you need to play, and uh, yeah. and it's it's interesting to notice this. It's also interesting to notice that this is not universal to let's say you do linear functional approximation. If you were doing state aggregation, uh, Jeff knows that really well. And then there is no such extra cost. Uh, so it, it's kind of interesting that the representation itself starts to play a role in terms of how much inflation of the misspecification level you will need to accept. And so that raises the question, can we somehow play with this and, and exploit this and, and somehow use it to your right. advantage? Uh, I think those are really interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I sort of have the, the feeling, the, the intuition that um, when we have a bad worst case approximation error, right, one, one direction is we think some area is much better than it really is. And so that's sort of self-fixing. We want to go there and then we'll discover it isn't quite the utopia we believe it to be, right? But the other direction where something really is better than we think it is, we may never discover that. And it might take us a very long time uh, to do enough exploration to discover that. Um, is that intuition enough or is there more that we, that we need? And I think, um, uh, Sham, you've been waiting to say something for a while, so maybe you can jump in. Uh, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll um, maybe follow up on that point and uh, what uh, Chaba said and some points by Emma. So just sort of backing up a bit on Jeff's question about these various like pessimistic results. that has kind of been uh, a body of results kind of showing that things we expect to work in supervised learning, like you realize ability that, you know, maybe our optimal Q function uh, is realizable with some features, they do not work in reinforcement learning. And there's been a long line of many of us sort of banging on this and trying to understand this, both offline and online settings. Now, uh, one side is to say, hey, do we really care about pessimistic results? What is that, uh, you know, the, there's a while in supervised learning where we look at lots of pessimistic results and at the end of the day, maybe they didn't lead to anything. But there's an argument here that these results really do uh, tell us something pretty deep because what Emma was alluding to is now we need to think about more structural assumptions that are reasonable and what these sort of results are telling us are that uh, we actually have to get something more out of our representations than the kind of naive things of just capturing uh, optimal value functions. And in particular, uh, nearly all of the results, the types of things that our representations capture are not just capturing uh, the value of a good policy, uh, either implicitly or explicitly, these features tend to uh, say something about how the dynamics behave. Uh, like you can back up the features through the dynamics. And, and, and this is where things are interesting because I think in many settings, we do not want a very accurate model of the world. Like I don't want a pixel by pixel model of how to ge generate images, but these results basically say we need some interplay between the dynamics and the rewards. And it's not, and, and it's subtle now because as Emma pointed out, yes, in RL we have interactions, so there's hope to try to fix things. But then there's a real question of what are we trying to fix here when things are going wrong? And, and that's where these questions about what our representations need to capture, I, I think that is actually where we're starting to shed light on a family of models of what conditions we need to have. And then we can start designing algorithms, which is, oh, we don't just need to predict reward. Uh, obviously, we, you know, in a lot of settings, we don't need to build a full model of the world, but what's that sweet spot in between? And that's very problem dependent. And, uh, and, and you know, so, so I think there's uh, quite a lot of excitement in this area now, and, you know, both in theory and practice. I think we have plenty of evidence that, you know, these, are, these issues are real. Cool. So, um, so I want to, um, I don't want to like stop this topic because it's really interesting, but I want to shake things up a little bit. So maybe like add a, add a wrinkle to the discussion because we're getting, um, closer to the end of our allotted time. So I was, um, I've seen sort of a, um, and a back and forth in the literature about whether special purpose or general purpose architectures are, are better for reinforcement learning. And I think that's connected to the questions we've already been discussing. So by a special architecture, I mean something like uh, a value iteration network where you encode the structure of the value iteration algorithm into a, into a deep network that you're training versus for a general purpose architecture, I'm thinking something like a transformer. I was at a talk the other week when I heard somebody claim that, you know, at least for relatively simple problems, you don't need to do combinatorial search because your transformer just does it for you. So um, uh, I wanted to uh, to sort of throw that question out into the uh, into the ether. I can draw a, a few analogies. I mean, this topic Thanks. has been discussed a lot on the supervised learning case, in particular in applications such as computer vision, natural language processing. I don't have a strong point of view of where we're going to tend to in the long term. What, what I observe is two things. One, special purpose architectures definitely seem to help us make progress. We often notice sort of step change when we have the introduction. And, and we have to be a little bit of careful because there's a ton of innovation on the architecture side, a lot of which is eminently forgettable. But still, we do make some meaningful steps, you know, Convnet's transformers more recently who really drive the field forward. So I think it, that has an important role to play. The, the second point I'll bring to the table is really a call for, for rigor in experimentation. And, and 
particularly with this question of developing new architectures is one of the places where, you know, we see the experiments conducted in a way that your new hypothesis versus the baselines are not necessarily compared fairly and, and, and with the level of, you know, neutrality that we would want. And that can really lead the field astray. Yeah. And so we have to be very, very careful when asking that specific question, if we want to learn anything from our... Yeah from our colleagues who are working in supervised settings. Yeah, I have to, I have to say, um, you know, uh, plus plus to that one, right? Um, I really, um, I really uh, am often left flat by new architecture papers where I, you know, the new architecture does like blows some benchmark out of the water and I'm left with zero understanding after reading the paper of why that happened. And I think that's even more true maybe in reinforcement learning than it is in other domains. Um, so, so yes, um, you know, there are from the, the, um, the different architectural ideas, there, there are a bunch that seem really potentially, um, relevant to RL. So for example, ideas related to memory, um, right? Because RL, you have to sometimes build yourself a state, which requires, um, requires memory, right? And the, the, um, you know, I've seen people do interesting experiments about like different memory architectures, whether they're better or worse at retaining state information in RL. And I found that to be really enlightening. Um, or this idea of um, uh, multi multiplicative combination, right? So that's been something that's, that's um, uh, been part of a bunch of different architectures. And it, um, uh, I always am struck by how similar that is to the computation that you would do in a Bayes rule update to do state tracking in a POMDP, right? And I've seen like a very few papers that are sort of trying to follow that connection. Um, I don't know if any of uh, the rest of you have, have seen like, you know, architectural ideas that really sort of spoke to you um, for their uh, um, uh, applicability to RL. Uh, Sham. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll come back to this point uh, I started with about a trend that was exciting to me. Uh, and th this is, again, this question about what, how do we think about general purpose architectures? And, and transformers uh, are one of these architectures. You know, uh, Granted, I think what you all said is spot on because we're getting very good results, but we'd like to understand h how to more rigorously compare them. But some of these results with transformers are exciting both in terms of the way they handle memory, but the ones I found particularly compelling uh, are these results where they can complete programs. They're literally just trained on lots of programs and they will run. They will run in a way that does not seem like this should happen. It really looks like a paradigm shift. And the same thing with uh, like mathematical differentiation integration. Th these things can work better than Mathematica. And what's interesting here uh, about uh, sort of Jeff's point about general purpose architectures is these are problems where it seems like internally you might expect some planning component because there are rules about mathematics. We aren't training them based on the rules. Certain architectures uh, with certain amounts of training, uh, at least empirically, uh, we've seen they can pull this off to a degree which at least in my viewpoint, this really looks like a bit of a paradigm shift because I would not have believed this is possible. Now, there's a question of like, what's the secret sauce here? But it, it certainly happened, it, at least for me, that, that it's a significant amount of um, like planning and rule discovery internally. Uh, so. Yeah, so what's, what's going on there? Like, how are they, you know, do we have any intuition for how they're managing to solve these combinatorial and optimization or planning problems? They certainly train a lot, but uh, I, I'm, yeah, I didn't, is that, does anyone have intuition? I, like, I'm impressed. Like, there's, yeah. this is the bottom line. Likewise, yeah. I, I will just add, you know, there's a lot of work coming out on the NLP side showing that they're not learning nearly as well as we think for language models. We know they're still using some really surface distributional model rather than what we assume to be a deeper understanding. So I would, I guess I would keep a, a healthy degree of skepticism that the same may be happening for the cases that Sean mentioned. Yeah. 
in terms of program synthesis and so on. Um, and we may we may find soon that that we're still you know much more sort of rote and parroting than than we think. Right. Um, and have a longer road to go. Yeah, I'm not aware of anybody who's tried to study whether they're solving hard optimization, like how hard are the optimization problems that they're solving. But it is interesting that there's, you know, it's interesting they can do it at all. Well, in my sense, too, so I think um, uh, there's really interesting questions about whether the tasks we want to solve in AI are ones that involve mimicking human level performance really well. And I think there's a huge number of places where if we could mimic human level performance, that would already be incredible. And I think we see that in NLP. And even those sort of surface distribution models, I think that's a really interesting point, but it might be sufficient. Um, and I, uh, Whereas if we want to go beyond human level performance, I think we will need deeper level understanding and, um, and more rich um, innovation. But I, my guess, and I say this is not a roboticist, is that the amount of information and training opportunities, say, in videos, might enable us to make major steps forward in robotics by similarly leveraging these huge sort of um, uh, demonstrations of how to do an enormous range of behaviors where people can do it well, but yet we lack that ability to replicate in robots. So I'd be curious from Joelle's perspective or others whether they think either video or other opportunities um, other data sources might allow us to replicate human performance in many places where we have not yet been able to do so. Maybe I apologize. I can't. I can't chat or anything. So uh, just a really brief. Go ahead. Um, I completely agree with the, the point you just made, Emma. That kind of mimicking is, you know, is good in some tasks. Um, but there's also kind of the, the I think the, the the type of fault tolerance that you, you can live with, right? So having a conversation, a dialogue with somebody, and if you make mistakes, it's it's it doesn't really matter, right? People can understand when you use the wrong words or you know say something that that's nonsensical. They can overlook it. Um, in program synthesis, uh, you know, I think you're going to be a lot less fault tolerant. So I'd be curious to know, and I, I, I know there's a lot of great work going on there. Be curious to know how brittle these things are. You know, I think, Joelle, your point speaks, it was, was about kind of the brittleness that you see in a lot of these models. And when we're talking about other types of planning applications, they're, they're, I think there's a there, there's a question of not just do we want to exceed human performance, but how safe, you know, how fault tolerant are can these systems actually be? In some sense, but. I feel like it's more than just like it's not just mimicking human performance. Like that is certainly a very important component, but but also it's being able to put together pieces of human performance that you've seen in different contexts, right? Like it's you know getting back a little bit to the combinatorial question. But you can stitch together things in a way that's very still very brittle, right? And in yes. some cases, yeah. you know, that brittleness is immaterial. People can overlook it. In other cases, it can be absolutely right. devastating. Yeah. I think actually what's going on here is that we have really bad general intuitions about what can you do with what kind of things. Uh, like neural networks keep surprise us. Uh, and we're thinking about some tasks as being really hard and they solve it. And then they just ask us that we, we don't have good intuitions about like, what can you solve with surface level or like how well you want to label that uh, approaches and what can't. And and so that just to me speaks to to all limitations. And, and as we learn together <laughs> with these architectures from what they can do and what they can't do, uh, I think we'll have a much better understanding, and then that's that's how you make progress eventually. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, we are starting to run out of time. So, um, you know, I hate to cut off this discussion. We're, we're going to have to have a part two of this panel at some point. Um, I wanted to say thank you so much to uh, all of you for participating in the panel. I've really enjoyed uh, uh, this discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, if anybody wants to say a last couple of words before we sign off. There's more than a couple of words. It's either zero or many, right? That's the, uh, that's the, yeah. All right. Well, so thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I think that's, uh, that concludes our panel. Thank you, everybody. Thank it's you. really great to see everyone. Yeah, thanks.